This chapter is fairly theoretical, so let's just start off by explaining where we're going. We're going to get a mathematical statement of the second law along the way. We're going to discover a new property that is useful called entropy. We're going to use entropy to help us solve problems. So to get a mathematical statement of the second law, we need to consider a system that receives thermal energy from a reservoir at temperature TR. So there's a, a, an amount of thermal energy that comes in. We'll call it QR. That's the heat transfer that comes in uh, to the system. The system consists of everything inside of the, the dotted lines. And there is a reversible cyclic device at the top that is accepting thermal energy, transforming a portion of that thermal energy into work, and then rejecting waste heat to a, another system that is internal to the overall system. And the overall system is combined together. So it consists of the, the little system plus the uh, reversible cyclic device. Now we've got differentials in front of all of these different flows across the system boundaries because we're only talking about a small amount of energy transfer. We're not talking about something that's going to go on for days and days or be a very large quantity of energy transfer. Now you'll notice that the waste heat coming out of the cyclic device is internal to the grand system. It's internal and it moves from the cyclic system to the smaller system at a temperature T. Obviously if that smaller system expands for a while that temperature could change and we're not trying to do that. We just want this process to occur for a very short period of time. So if we were to write an energy balance around the, the entire system we could analyze it and say well there's combined work. There's work produced by the cyclic system W sub reversible and work produced by that system that's internal to the overall system which we will call W sub S, Y, S. When we combine those two, when we add them together, that's W sub C, the combined work. Now, this work has to be produced from, well, the system, and so the amount of energy in the system either goes down or heat is transferred in to take place of that energy, right? It, energy can't be created or destroyed, so this energy that comes out as combined work must have either come from the heat that came into the system or must have depleted the energy in the system itself. So that's just an energy balance around the, the entire system. Now we know for the upper portion, the, the, the round section that is the reversible heat engine, we know that the ratio of heat flows across it is equal to the ratio of the temperatures across it. The temperature of the thermal source of energy and the temperature of the waste heat. Okay, we know that that's true because it's a reversible heat engine. Now I realize we can't actually make reversible heat engines, so why are we talking about this? Well, we'll come up with something that's very useful. It'll first of all describe reversible systems, and then we'll extend it to talk about real systems, and it'll have something very important to say about real systems. Now we can take this relationship for the reversible heat engine and rearrange it to write the external heat flow in terms of the temperature of the external thermal energy reservoir and then the flow of energy between the reversible system and the other system that's internal to the overall or grand system. If we do that we can then make a substitution for the differential uh, thermal energy that flows in via heat into the system from the thermal energy reservoir. So if we make that substitution then this is where we are. Okay, we've just written an energy balance that's for a really small amount of energy transfer. Because we're out of room on that slide, I'm going to copy the energy balance and the system or the graphic here onto another slide and continue our discussion. Now, if you look at this, you might say, well, it looks like we're breaking the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law. Well, if we were actually operating this thing continuously, you know, and we were thinking that we we're going to get some work out, well then we would have to add up all that work by integrating over a whole cycle, right, where the system comes back to where it starts. Now, for the reversible cyclic device, that's not such a big deal, but we have a little bit of a problem with that lower system. It's not something that can ever come back to where it starts. So if we try to integrate over some cycle and think we're going to get some combined work out of this, 
Well, we fundamentally got a problem. I mean, we, we can write it mathematically, right? We can integrate this differential equation and write it, as you see on the right-hand side, where that combined work then is equal to, well, the, the temperature of the reservoir would come out because it's constant. We need to integrate the ratio of dq over t. And if we could actually operate this thing on a cycle, then the amount of change in the energy of the whole system would, would be zero and just go away. So this is fanciful thinking, right? We can't actually do this because if we did, we'd break the Kelvin-Planck statement of the second law. So we know that this combined work we get out is at least zero and probably less, right? So since we can't actually do this, then we might actually have to put work into this to get anything interesting at all to happen. So we'll just write that that combined work, or in other words, that integral on the right-hand side, must be less than or equal to zero. Otherwise, we break the Kelvin-Planck statement, and by extension, the Clausius statement of the second law, as we learned in the last chapter. So this combined work, if we did perform some kind of cycle, if we let this, this uh, work on a cycle, the amount of work we expect out is at best zero and probably less. We probably have to put work into it to make anything interesting happen. And this is the Clausius statement of the second law because think about it, the temperature of the reservoir is going to be measured on an absolute scale. So it is not the thing that is less than zero. It must be that cyclic integral that is less than or equal to zero. Well, if we make this extra system that we've got inside of the, the whole system, if we make it internally reversible, well, what would that mean? Well, that would mean that we'd have a reversible cyclic device and at least an internally reversible system. Could we do that in any way? Well, sure. I mean, we could put a fluid in there that was, you know, saturated mixture of liquid and vapor and then it would be an internally reversible system because as we add heat to it all that would happen the temperature would remain constant and the relative amount of vapor and liquid would change there'd be more vapor as we added heat and so it could do some work so if this is reversible we should be able to reverse the entire system now because everything inside of it is either reversible or internally reversible and so then we would think that this integral would be greater than or equal to zero because we're just reversing everything, right? We're just taking this combined system and reversing it, operating it in reverse. But obviously we know that can't work, okay? Even if the system is internally reversible, well, we really wouldn't expect to have to put any work in. The combined work we would get out, this is saying, would be greater than or equal to zero. There's no way we'd, you know, at best have to put work in and that work would just leave as, well, it would leave as heat, right? So this doesn't make a lot of sense. If it's supposed to be reversible, and yet we know we can't get any combined out of work out of this, we've kind of got two things in conflict with one another. One saying that this integral has to be greater than or equal to zero. The other one saying it has to be less than or equal to zero. And so we conclude that the combined work must simply be equal to zero in the case where that uh, system is internally reversible, because otherwise we break the Kelvin-Planck statement of the second law. So for internally reversible systems, we've discovered that this cyclic integral thing that seems interesting must come out to zero. Now, why is that interesting? Well, it's because it leads us to a new property. I put a, a card from Monopoly up there. You always get a new property, right, when you land on it and you can afford to buy it. I never win at Monopoly. But that's because the property we're talking about here is a little different than a property in monopoly. It's not something you own, it's something that is a characteristic of the system. It's, it's innately there, it's something that just exists by the nature of the system. And So if you think about volume, for example, volume is a property of a system. So if you have a piston that's you know, allowing a volume of a system of one cubic meter and you move it out so now the system contains three cubic meters above the piston of volume and then you move it back to one cubic meter, you've not changed anything, right? The system is back where it started. What does the cyclic integral mean? Well, the cyclic integral means if this is a cycle, which we see it is, we went from a volume of one cubic meter to three and now back to one. If we add up all of those infinitesimal changes in volume, if we integrate them from one cubic meter, add up, add up, add up, add up, now we're at three cubic meters, now subtract, 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 now we're at one cubic meter again. If you add up all those changes in volume, you'll find that it's zero. And, and you know this, right? You know that it really wouldn't matter how the piston moved. The piston could move out to four cubic meters, then come back to a half a cubic meter, and then move out to 20. It really wouldn't matter. What would The only thing that would matter is the initial and final state of the system. And since those two are identical by definition, since we're talking about a cycle, 
well then the sum of all the volume changes is zero. It's just the difference between the initial and final state of volume and those two are the same. They're both one cubic meter. That difference is zero. So the interesting thing about this is that if we integrate over a cycle the volume changes of a system we find that we get zero as long as it operates on a cycle. That's what that little circle means on the integral sign. It just means we're, we're integrating between two limits where the, the initial and final limit are the same state. So it's interesting that when we integrate this property we get zero. In fact what you could show is that it's the same thing for energy. If you integrate energy which is another property of the system over a cycle the system will have the same amount of energy at the end of the cycle as it had at the beginning. That's just the definition of the cycle, right? All of the properties of the system come back to where they were. There's no change in them. And the interesting thing is not only is there no change, but if you were to add up all the differential changes along the process path, what you would find is that integral would be zero. That's a fundamentally different thing than saying just take the difference between the initial and final state. What this means then is that if we integrate over a cycle any property we will get zero. And that thing, whatever it is, must be a property of the system. So if we found this thing that we integrate on a cycle and its integral comes out to zero, that thing must be a property of the system. And this shouldn't be a big surprise because remember in the system that I drew, the differential heat transfer between the reversible system and the internal reversible system and the temperature at which that heat flows or flowed that ratio was inside the system. It was a property of the system, right? It wasn't really affected by things external to the system. It was something inside of it. So that's not really a, a really big surprise. But what's interesting about this is this is a new property. Just like we can talk about differential changes in volume, differential changes in internal energy, this dq over t we will define as a differential change in entropy. So that's what that three line equals sign means we're defining ds a differential change in entropy which we now recognize as a property of the system as dq over t now notice this definition only holds for an internally reversible system and the units that we have are kilojoules per kelvin now if you understand all of that great if you don't it's okay i'm not sure that i understand it completely here's the important point the important point is that because heat only flows from hot to cold on its own there's another property that we could talk about called entropy and that property will help us solve problems. It has units of energy per temperature, but you got to be careful because the temperature has to be in absolute units. So we can tabulate this property just like we do others. It's related to other properties. Just like you know the ideal gas law, right? That's one of the simplest property relationships and you earn it or you learn it early on typically in chemistry. But you learn this, and it relates pressure, volume, and temperature. Those are properties of the system that are being related together. And in the same way, there are other relationships we will discover between entropy and other properties as well. And that, that relationship varies a little bit depending on exactly what the phase of the substance might be. But we'll discover those a little bit later. So what this means is we can talk about the entropy change for reversible process, just like we can talk about the volume change. Uh, of a system or we can talk about its energy change and so forth and actually we don't really need to know the process path details we can just take the difference between the initial and final entropies in the two states and that will give us our change so integrating this differential thing ends up with a delta right it ends up with a change where again all we need to know is the property in the two states now understand now we're not talking about a cycle we're talking about moving from one state to another but this is convenient because we can just say delta S equals S2 minus S1. I don't care what the process looks like. You tell me the initial and the final state and I'll tell you the entropy change. So we can actually integrate this thing and, and write that delta S equals the integral between the two states from 1 to 2 of this new property called entropy. Now this seems like a pointless thought exercise, right? I mean, the, the derivation may not be particularly clear to you and uh, we already said that this DS thing is only good for internally reversible systems so isn't this kind of like a mirage in the desert where you know you're walking along and you see a mirage and it's more your imagination than anything else right there's actually nothing there so these internally reversible systems which you know totally reversible systems aren't possible internally reversible seems not real practical so aren't we just wasting our time talking about this well Maybe, maybe not. This actually reminded me, I used to watch a, uh, an actor called Don Knotts, that was his name, you may have seen him. He was on the Andy Griffiths show, if you've ever seen any of those. He and Tim Conway paired up for a little while, and 
did, made several movies together, Disney movies, The Apple Dumpling Gang and then Rides Again. And then another, another one, actually. I can't remember the name of it, but they were bumbling detectives that managed to solve the case. I thought they were a great comedy duo. You know, I thought they could have done as much as, you know, Laurel and Hardy or the Marx Brothers or any of those classic uh, comedians that always had a sidekick or a group and, you know, sort of found magic between them. I think these two had a really good... Uh, comedic relationship. I don't know why they didn't make more movies, but Don Knotts happened to star in one movie of his own. I think it was made in the 60s at some point called Shakiest Gun in the West. And, you know, it's that typical cheesy uh, comedy western movie. Uh, and it was hilarious. If you ever get the chance to watch it, I'd highly recommend it. You can turn it on and, you know, if there are kids around, it's no problem. There's not going to be any blood and guts or, you know, any too much violence or anything like that. No bad words. A uh, very fra family-friendly uh, film. But in the end, uh, it turns out he, he thought he was a gunslinger. And it turned out his wife was the gunslinger. And through a series of events, she had been captured. He was going out to rescue her. You know, he's going to be the big hero and so forth. And he was walking along. And I guess he, you know, he was a tenderfoot. He was from back east, right? This is back in the old days. And he didn't, I guess he didn't realize he needed water. And so he's walking along. Of course, it's wearing him down. He's in the desert. And uh, he's walking along, he says, water, water, I need water, got to have water. And then he, he looks and there's a mirage, you know, and he thinks it's water, so he's running towards it. He's, he dives into it and it's just sand, so he gets a mouthful of sand. This happens, of course, predictably a couple of times. And then finally, he sees it in the distance, he sees water, and he finally says, oh, I, I don't think it's water. He just keeps walking forward. And, of course, that's when he falls into the water and, and you know, and comes up bobbing for air, saying, air, air, I've got to have air, you know. So, so why are we dealing with this seemingly imaginary thing? Why bother with it? Well, it's because we can use it to get entropy changes for a real process. So now we're going to get that mathematical statement of the second law. Okay, so we started off with the Clausius inequality. If we write that inequality, we can apply it to a cycle where that cycle consists of a forward process from 1 to 2 that is either reversible or irreversible. It could be a real process. And then a reverse process from state 2 to state 1 that is the internally reversible path. You see, we can't say anything yet about the entropy change on the uh, irreversible path, we can only say something about what happens on the at least internally reversible path because that's where we know what this integral should come out to be. So this the cyclic integral we've got applies to any real process, it's just that the less than or equal to zero kind of hampers our math, right? Anytime we have an inequality we always try to change it to an equality if we can. So while we know a little bit about this cyclic integral and we can talk about entropy changes between state 2 to state 1 in the internally reversible path, we really have to apply the whole integral to the whole cycle and that doesn't really help us much. But what if we were to break up this integral into two parts? The forward integral from state 1 to state 2 for the real portion, right, the, the real process, and then from state uh, 2 back to state 1. So that's the second part of the integral there for the internally reversible process. Now, all we've done is taken the cyclic integral and said, well, it's a cycle that's made up of two processes. We're just going to break them up into the two processes, just like you can in calculus. You can break up an integral into two parts, right, and evaluate them separately. That's not a problem. Because uh, obviously from 1 to 2 to 2 to 1 is the cycle, so we're just integrating over the whole cycle still. And that must still be less than or equal to 0, just like it said in the original form. So let's analyze the term that we know what to do with. That second term we know what to do with. So we're going to flip the limits of integration and just notice that we're talking about a change in entropy. S2 minus S1 equals the integral from state 1 to state 2, so it's final minus initial, right, 2 minus 1 of this internally reversible differential entropy thing, okay? Now, the term that we have actually has the limits reversed, so we'll, to represent the reverse conditions, the reverse states, we'll just flip the, sign, or the, the numbers on the S1 and S2 and plug them into the equation, you see. So we've, we've substituted the integral term, which we know how to integrate, it's just the entropy difference between the two states, We've substituted that in for the, the second integral. Now, again, we don't really like inequality, so the first thing we're going to do is move the entropy change to the right-hand side of the equation. That requires flipping the, the numbers again, right, the, the subscripts. 
uh, we're just basically subtracting the term from both sides and so that flips the subscripts however you want to think about it so now we've got the entropy change and it was given to us by the theoretical process but notice it says something important about the real process it says the difference in entropy between state 2 and state 1 is greater than or equal to the integral of the entropy changes from state 1 to state 2 along the real path and since we don't like inequalities we can just add a fudge factor to the the left hand side right and let me flip everything around again to say that the entropy change for the real process now is equal to all of the differential entropy changes from state 1 to state 2 plus some other little bit, some generated entropy. Now this is really important. So if you understand all the derivation, that's great. If all you get is this last equation in the box, that's what you really need because it says something really important. It says that for the real process, the actual entropy change you will get is the entropy change you know integrated over the process plus some extra so we finally found a way to get something for free the problem is it's something we don't want this entropy always uh, will degrade the performance of the engineering systems that we design and build and it's something we try to minimize we try to minimize the amount of entropy generated but this is a really important uh, equation. What it really says is that even if you have a system that is isolated from the rest of the universe, the system, as it moves from one state to another, can change its entropy. Its entropy change can be greater than zero because entropy can be generated from nothing. In fact, reversible processes don't generate any entropy, and that's why they don't exist irreversible processes or in other words real processes always generate ent entropy and it's po impossible for the generated entropy to li be less than zero so you can't destroy entropy it's, it's another statement once things are mixed up they don't just unmix on their own at least not along a time scale that's practical so for engineering purposes they never unmix and this is why processes occur in only one direction they occur in the direction where entropy is generated Entropy is not conserved. It is created from nothing, and unfortunately, it's something that doesn't help. It's something that is bad for us. However, there's a silver lining to every dark cloud, and the measure of the amount of entropy that's generated by you know, a pump or a motor or whatever the case may be, that measure indicates the magnitude of ir irreversibility and therefore how, how bad of a system it is. The more entropy it generates, the worse it is. So what is entropy? Well, we can define absolute entropy by this equation where K is the Boltzmann constant and P is the thermodynamic probability. Well, what is that? Well, it's basically the number of possible arrangements of the microscopic system. What does that mean? Well, really, for our sake, we're more interested in the entropy of energy, not disorganized items. You can think of it in terms of where things are in space, and that's a good intuitive explanation, but we're interested in the entropy of energy. And so what we're really interested in is the number of ways that energy in a system can be distributed. For example, let's say we have a box, and in that box we only have one molecule of gas, okay? And let's just say that uh, the, uh, this, this, this box doesn't interact with the, um, the, the molecule at all except to reverse its direction okay as it bounces around inside well how many different ways can the energy of that molecule be distributed well there's only one way right now because that molecule can be at different positions you can say there's still some entropy it's non-zero because there's different probable arrangements right different places that it can be and it's the thing carrying the energy and so you could say that well there might be several let's let's pretend we have a box that's small enough that the molecule can only exist in four different places. Well, there's four different places it can be, right? So you've got a, a quarter chance of finding it in any one of those locations. And that leads us to this idea of thermodynamic probability. But basically, the more places it can be, the higher the entropy is, okay? Now, this is kind of nice for absolute entropy, but we're not going to use it as much as we'd use, say, absolute temperature, for example. 
but I think it helps you understand what entropy is. For example, if we had a, a perfect crystal, right? No errors in it, you know, no dislocations, everything perfectly arranged, and the temperature of that crystal was exactly zero Kelvin, then its entropy by definition would be zero because all of the energy in the crystal has only one configuration, right? There's a 100% probability you will find it in a particular configuration. And so since the natural logarithm of one is zero, then the entropy is zero in that case. Obviously, as the temperature of the crystal in increases, then the amount of energy in the crystal increases and the number of ways that that energy can be distributed within the, the crystal increases. And so the entropy increases. So we're really trying to get away from understanding this intuitively in the sense of, you know, arrangement of, of items and more think about it as the arrangement of energy and exactly how the energy is distributed within the system and understanding that every packet of energy, if you want to think about it that way, can be at many different locations, right? So there's many different ways that the energy could be distributed within the system. We're just observing one particular one that happened to occur. Now this might give you the idea too though that the more spread out the molecules are, the more they're moving around, the more they're carrying their energy around with them, there's more ways that the energy can be distributed because if the molecules are farther apart, they can occupy more different places, right? Whereas in a solid, you know, the, the, the atoms and molecules are all held in place. They don't move around as much. I mean, that might vibrate a little bit. That restricts the number of ways that the energy can be distributed. And so solids typically have less entropy than liquids and gases than have even higher entropies. So in this cartoon, which I hope helps you, it says, Mom, it isn't fair for you to spend the morning folding, and then she shakes out the laundry, our laundry. It all comes out in one very particular configuration that is obviously desirable, right? So this is something that would not happen, but apparently experience can make it happen. I, I don't know about that. I think in nature, obviously, this doesn't happen for all practical purposes. But that's one particular configuration that could occur for the laundry. It's just highly unlikely. Now, of course, this is leading us back to the idea that entropy has to do with the arrangement of things, whereas really we want to focus on the arrangement of energy. And fortunately, we don't really have to understand entropy in full detail. It's a property, and we can use it. As long as we can tabulate it, we can use it, and that makes it useful. It also um, is something that suggests that we could measure entropy changes and from that determine how well our systems are operating.